this our government races against time to avert what could potentially be a shutdown of the public sector if it fails to heed to demands to decisively deal with Galamse. The National Labor Commission, meanwhile, is set to meet organized labor in an attempt to find a makeable solution to labor's disagreement with government's approach to dealing with illegal mining menace. And with barely 24 hours to protests geared at compelling the state to discontinue the trial of anti Galamse protesters, the Attorney General wants the police to swiftly conclude its investigations to enable release of the innocent. And I am Mawena Egbeta. The bulletin starts right now. Government has up to eight days to accede to the demands of labor in announcing a state of emergency and banning completely all small-scale mining activity in the country to avoid a full-blown industrial strike. Labor has set October 10 to begin the industrial action in what many environment experts see as the biggest possible push to have government take decisive action against the ongoing devastation of the country's lands, forest cover and river bodies. There have, however, been concerns over the date set for the strike to begin. We'll hear from the leadership of organized labor shortly. But first, let's walk you through the demands they are making uh, of government this afternoon, which is pushing them to uh, December, or not December, so October 10 for this particular strike. Let's walk you through that this afternoon, exactly what uh, Labour is demanding of governments this afternoon, uh, reason for which, like I mentioned, they have set October 10 for the strike. Now, of the, of the many demands, the first is the immediate declaration of a state of emergency. That's been long drawn and then the revocation of law allowing uh, mining in forest reserves. They are asking for special courts to prosecute mining offenses in the country. And then revocation of law which declassified parts of the Achimota forest as a reserve and all political parties to sign a peace pact banning Galamse. And so that's it. And in addition to that as well, a complete ban on all small-scale mining activities in the country. The Lands and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abu Jinapo, he, on September 18, assured government will shortly come out with a roadmap to deal with the menace. Some nation wreckers, motivated by their own selfish interests, continue to destroy our water bodies and forest reserves. We are aware that what we are dealing with is money, and the cartels involved will always try to find ways of outwitting us. But we will not relent on our efforts. We will continue to adopt the necessary measures to protect our water bodies, environment, and forest reserves. And Ananum's cooperation and support will be invaluable. We welcome the various concerns that have been raised by several groups of people, as well as their recommendations for dealing with this matter. The President of the Republic, His Excellency Nadidan Kwakufuado, has constituted an ad hoc ministerial committee under the chairmanship of the Minister for National Security to engage all stakeholders and to find a common ground to fight this menace. Yesterday, the committee met with organized labor and in the coming days, we will engage with other groups of people to ensure that we come to grips with this matter. Meanwhile, Secretary General of the TUC, Joshua Ansa, says the ministerial committee has justified a decision to give government up until October 10th to address the concerns of labor. He maintains the strike will be called off only if government heeds to their demands. We are rather preparing ourselves for this action. To declare a later one strike is not just, just wake up one day and you are declaring a strike. It's need planning. Okay. We need to plan and plan very well. Our members have to be informed 
Our members must understand why they are going to lay down their tools. Our members must be prepared so that when we say that, let's lay down tools, everybody will be on, 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 on top of that. Okay. So it's for our own planning and not that we are giving anybody any time. I that see. That's how you uh, plan, yes. But if government decides to act within this period, then, you, of course, you call off the strike. No, what, what, what if government decides to act? It, 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 that is our demand. We want the ABCD from the government. If government does it, I mean, then there's no need of going on strike. If it doesn't do it, that's why I say that if government fails to adhere to our, 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 our demand, then on the tent, it's it, it already declared that we will go on national strike. People are politicizing all the development issue. I think that organized labor is coming clear, it's coming clean with a good decision. Now, this is a nationwide, this is a nation issue. It's affecting everybody in this country, and we should stop politicizing this issue. All what Labour is calling the government to do is to ensure that all political parties, be it MPP, NDP, CP, whatever, to come and sign a pact on their position on this money that is killing this very country. More on this right now, the National Labour Commission, we understand, is meeting the leadership of organized labor over their demands on government to end Galamse and the impending strike. Uh, Daniel Lepoku is a labor correspondent following this meeting closely. He's joining us with a bit more on, on this. Daniel, good afternoon to you. First things first, what has the Labour Commission to do with the situation at all? Right, so good afternoon to Kermini. Um, labor Commission is here to meet the leadership of organized labor after they made a declaration yesterday. When you look at, when you listen to the National Labor Commission actually, the issues concerning Galamse clearly does not fall within their mandate. But because, labor, because the organized labor decided to embark on a strike, that has invoked the powers of the commission for them to step in. Mm. So hopefully from now to next week, Wednesday, the National Labor Commission is to meet the leadership of organized labor. It would appear that we have lost uh, Daniel over that connection. But Daniel was telling us about that meeting between Labour Commission and uh, the organised organized Labour who have threatened to strike on October 10th if government does nothing about, uh, you know, Galamse at the moment. To recall that uh, the workers, the public sector workers, had give, given government a long time, about a week, uh, to deal with the issues within that period. We know that uh, the leader of the um, interministerial task force had met with organized labor. Uh, it would appear that meeting ended inconclu inconclusively after the September 30th deadline. Labor then announced that on October 10th they will embark on a strike. And Daniel, you're back on the telephone. You were telling us that because of the strike, Labor Commission now becomes concerned about the situation between uh, government as the employer and organized labor as employees. Talk to us a bit more. Right, right, absolutely so. The um, National Labor Commission has decided to invite the leadership of organized labor that by when is the next week, they should meet them. They went on a legal break and they have resumed today. So the commissioners will firm up a decision today that hopefully by close of this week, they should officially invite the leadership of organized labor to appear before. When we look at the matters involved, labor is asking for a total ban of small scale mining and also galamsey. And that clearly does not fall within the mandate of the National Labor Commission. But once labor co organized labor has decided to embark on a strike, then clearly that someone somehow falls within the mandate of the LNLC because they have invoked the right to strike. That is when the Labor Commission has decided to step in. Is the reason that they'll be inviting them. Hopefully by next week Wednesday, they will still also invite government to come and how, see how they'll be able to resolve the problem that we are not going to see any agitation or industrial action on the labor front after saying of October. But, I mean, like you rightly said, the uh, bone of contention really has nothing to do with the Labour Commission. And so what is the aim of the Labour Commission going into this meeting? Uh, to stop Labour from proceeding on a strike that is unrelated to work, really? Right. So when I spoke to the Executive Secretary, what he was telling me was that once it does not fall within their mandate, they are likely to discuss the content. The content here, i.e. means uh, the Labour calling for a total ban of small-scale mining and also Galamsey, which to the Labour Commissioner or to the Labour Commission, the most, most concerned to them that there is a need to see how they're able to resolve the problem. But for organized labor in its entirety, for them to drop their tools or to withdraw their services, then clearly the labor front to be affected. And that, that's really going to worsen the already difficult situation that 
is on the Labour Front now. It's the reason the Labour Commission has decided to step in this time around, invite the leadership of organized labor, and also invite the leadership of government for them to sit and be able to find a makeable solution to this particular matter. Hopefully by today they'll be able to finish that decision, and then a letter will be issued out to the various reading parties for them to come before the commissioners, and hopefully there'll be a meeting that close up next week before, before, before the strike begins. See, so what's been the reaction of the leadership of organized labor to this meeting? Right, so when we speak to them as organized labor, for them, they are all already in a situation where they are ready to honor any invitation given them. Let's not forget that they were able to honor the first invitation after the president commissioned a committee. The second committee was set up. They are telling about to climb into National Labor. Organized Labor is ready to appear before National Labor Commission and also to with our concerns before them. Now, the issue before the LNFC in case the organized labor should appear before it, this part is about guarantee and also does not move around the condition of service of workers. It has no impact on the condition of service of workers. The appellants have not been affected. They are welfare, job security, all these are different matters. But then to sit and discuss issues about guarantee, then obviously there should be a headway between all the parties that will sit and have the matters discussed. Very well, Daniel. We'll leave it here. Thank you so much. Daniel Opoku is our labor correspondent. Uh, let's head for the course, also Galamse related. The Attorney General Godfrey Yabuat Dame is urging the Chief Justice to direct judges handling Galamse related cases to complete them within a month, uh, speaking at the annual conference of the Association of Magistrates and Judges. Uh, the AG expressed concerns regarding more than 140 cases which are currently uh, in the courts. We can now speak to Lord Edouard Sarri, joining us live from, uh, you know, this court-related event. Uh, Lord, good afternoon. Talk to us about the AG's call. What else can you report? Lord, it would appear you are muted. No, we, we cannot hear you. Perhaps we should, uh, you know work on that uh, connection problem and then get back to you. But you recall that over 54 people, at least 54 people were arraigned uh, when the pro Democracy Hub protesters poured out onto the streets of Accra. Uh, well, after that event, they were arraigned and many of them remanded in police and prison custody. Following which, uh, we know that there have been calls for the release of these protesters. This is what the Attorney General has said subsequent to that. I respectfully call on you to direct all judges sitting on Galamse cases to conclude the cases, hearing of which has started within one month from the commencement of the legal year on 10th October 2024. Reasonably, it can be done. He goes on to say that I urge the police to swiftly conclude investigations by the next agenda date of the cases involving the prosecution of excesses from recent protests in Accra, so as to exclude by that date all those against whom sufficient evidence cannot be found to proceed further. I will also advise the prosecution to consider relevant bail applications made at the next adjourned dates of the cases. That's from uh, Godfrey Yabwa uh, Dame, who is the Attorney General. Let's try Lord again. Now, perhaps we'll be lucky with the connection. Lord, if you can hear me, uh, talk to us a bit more about the call from the AG. Mm, I see. What we'll do now is uh, we would reconnect with Lord over a different uh, medium. But uh, the call from the AG is coming at a time when uh, many people are preparing to he hit the streets again to demand the release of these protesters, uh, many of whom are in police and prison custody. But we'll try Lord again. In the meantime, let's send attention to uh, some related stories. And the related story has to do with the protesters, 53 of them who've been in custody, prison and 
police for over 10 days now and attempts by their lawyers to secure bail for them. Brown Sinadachi is one of the organizers of the protest as well, uh, set to come off tomorrow. Tag Free the Citizens demo is joining us via the phone lines right now uh, for a conversation. Uh, for starters, in relation to the protest tomorrow, uh, Brownson, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. All set for the protest tomorrow and the routes agreed upon with the police. Walk us through it. Yes, great. So uh, I want to say good afternoon to your listeners and viewers. Um, everything is set for tomorrow, Friday and Saturday. Um, the route has been agreed on and uh, the three days have been agreed on. And uh, as we stated in our letter, uh, we are going to start from Okonglo bus stop, then walk straight along the stretch to Sangrila. Then we turn right to, through uh, the Association International Route or stretch to Gold House. And then we join the Hila Liman Street or Road and then we continue to um, Osu Cemetery, then to uh, Independence Square. Expectation is that a number of petitions are to be delivered each day of the protest. Which agencies are you targeting with these petitions and what clearly are the demands? Exactly. So we are petitioning the Attorney General's office we are petitioning the uh, Ministry of Lands and uh, Natural Resources and Parliament. Now, so we believe that uh, in as much as the Ghana police have the, the right to issue any form of arrest, uh, they have to do that within uh, uh, the remit of their professional conduct. Now, so if you think that protesters have flouted certain rules and regulations, then you issue arrest within your professional conduct and you do not abuse the rights of the people. And we are all privy to the unlawful detention, denial of bail, and uh, even denial to uh, basic uh, um, rights like access to their lawyers. And all this we think are very unconstitutional, uh, unconstitutional. and so, so we are petitioning uh, the Attorney General's office to drop all the charges against the protesters and then release them from detention. Attorney General, on the petition to the Attorney General, he's been speaking today and says he's urging the courts to speedily uh, go through the various uh, cases before them, also in relation to the citizens or the protesters who are, who are arrested, and the fact that uh, bail should be granted to them and those who are innocent be allowed to let go and then those who are found culpable be dealt with as is prescribed by the law. How do you react to these comments that's, uh, that's, that are just coming through from the Attorney General? So I, I think the Attorney General is just trying to, you know, they, they've, they've been quiet over the course of this period when the happenings are going on. But when they realize that uh, the youth are coming out to uh, put their voices out there for a, a desperate cry, they, they decide to issue statements too. But then I think if that is the intention, that is a good, a good call from the Attorney General as well. It, it's a good call, I think. By, by the Attorney General. And so three days of protest and the last day I expected to petition Parliament, if I, if I got you accurately. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, uh, we, we have realized that uh, the Parliament have uh, control over seven bills, okay? So they can repeal a bill and then they can actually enact another bill, okay, to safeguard our environment and protect lives and, and uh, the lives of uh, 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 our people. So we are calling on them to repeal whatever LI gives access to people to distract our land, our water body, and our lives as well. So uh, uh, basically, that is what we, we are actually petitioning Parliament. And on Parliament also have to have the right to, to oversee uh, what we call uh, the growing executive power 
and other ones that is causing the unconstitutional conduct by state authorities. So we, we have quite a number of things in there. Right then, Brownson, appreciate uh, those thoughts. That's Brownson Adachi, is one of the conveners of the hashtag Free the Citizens, hashtag Stop Galam Say Now, protests slated for tomorrow all through to Saturday. We're here on TV3, we'll be there to provide you details of everything as it happens. We can return to that Attorney General's comment uh, about uh, the police investigating quite quickly. Uh, persons who've been picked up uh, over the reoccupied Jalobi protest. Lord has joined us this time via the phones. Lord, walk us through really what the position of the Attorney General is, because there's been those who've made the argument that, look, he files a nolly prosequa, he discontinues the case, but it doesn't seem, he doesn't seem to be towing that particular line. What's he been saying? Right, so the Attorney General, Dr. Dami, um has basically indicated that uh, there's not been much help from the judiciary as far as prosecution of persons um, involved or accused persons involved in illegal mining or galante. Now, he describes it as tardiness by the court because he says that presently there are over 140 cases involving 850 accused persons across the country and there's uh, very little uh, being done by the court. So he actually indicated or uh, he appealed to the Chief Justice, um, Jeffrey Chokon, who was um, present here to direct all the judges from the um, various courts hearing matters regarding illegal mining um, uh, to with Galamse to within a month from the resumption of the legal calendar complete or finalize the cases involving the Galamse. Now, this one, what you said, it was a bit of uh, what was better, Ranka, or a lot of murmuring within the hall, and he. Um, reiterated that this um, can be done, and so they need to put in their efforts as much as possible. He indicated that from the front of the prosecution or the judiciary, when they do this, it will um, sort of curb or dissuade people who want to venture into this um, galamsey. He also indicated that no amnesty should be granted to persons who have been found guilty of illegal mining activity or galamsey uh, miners. Uh, and, and specifically, uh, his mention of amnesty uh, will be on the protesters who are being prosecuted by his office. Uh, he's been speaking in relation to them, asking the police to speedily investigate that particular matter. What, what really, or what more has he been saying in that regard as well? Indeed, indeed, man. I, but even before that, I, I'd like to add that the comment that Attorney General made was hastily responded to by the Chief Justice, uh, who indicated that. It's not all of them cannot be laid at the um, feet of the court because in most some cases the prosecution do not do due diligence because um, there are cases where they haven't even filed some of the documents that they need to prosecute the matter. So he she also um, indicated that the prosecutors need to do their due diligence. So both parties will have to do um, their part. Now, when it comes to the protesters, the attorney general indicated that we are very close to elections and there are. There seems to be some form of demonstrations or protests to instill fear and cause um, public disaffection or chaos um, getting to the election. Now, he cited that regardless of the cause of the protest, how important it is, it is not an excuse to, um, for example, in infringe on the rights of movement of others and also attack public officers. Uh, although he's not... Um, particularly or immediately mentioned Democracy Hub immediately from what he said. He indicated that there are some, some persons who have been arrested for protesting and indicated that um, the prosecution or essentially the police should speed up their investigations to release persons who are not caught up, who are not part of the protest. But he did indicate that, and citing cases in other jurisdictions like the U.S. and the U.K., where persons who went on um, protests so uh, uh, as such were imprisoned. In, in, in prison. And so he's saying that essentially this is not an excuse, right. no matter how important it is. This right is then, Lord. Either. Thank you. That's my colleague, Lord Edouard Sare, providing us a bit more from 
at what the Attorney General has been saying. And the, on the subject of bail, really, which has to do with the arrest of the 53 arrested protesters, I want to provide you some updates right now this afternoon in relation to what we know has been uh, happening in court. Uh, from their lawyers who've been pushing actively for bail. So here's a trajectory. Uh, they were originally remanded by the circuit court to reappear October 8, October 9, and the likes. But the lawyers headed to the high court in a fresh push to secure bail for them. That's what we know. And they found processes seeking an expedited hearing because after the lawyers uh, went to the high court, the high court said October 7. Uh, f to hear their bail application. And then they found processes seeking an expedited hearing or praying the court to push the date forward from the 7th to somewhere around 3rd, you name it, so they can hear that bail application and then grant them bail. But here's what's happened. The High Court has adjourned hearing to October 7 after state attorneys raised concerns about non-attachment of circuit court proceedings to court document. And so what it means is that despite lawyers for these 53 pushing for the high court to grant them bail, the high court has set the date at October 7. They were seeking to have that date brought forward. It looks like nothing is going to happen and they might have to stay in uh, custody for up to the two weeks as was originally uh, directed by the circuit court. Away from that, the forest, forestry experts are warning that Ghana's access to the European Union's lucrative timber market is on the brink of a collapse with delays in ratifying timber permits, raising serious concerns about the government's commitment to sustainable forest management. Civil society organizations and forestry experts have warned that Ghana could lose its place in the EU's voluntary partnership agreement unless urgent steps are taken to finalize uh, the remaining leases. Let's have a conversation on the back of this. Noble Crosby Annan is at a news conference organized by the group. He joins us with a bit more on this. Good afternoon to you. What is accounting for Ghana's failure to meet this legal requirement? Well, Ghana's failure to fully implement the legal framework for timber trade and the voluntary partnership agreement with the EU is due to several factors. According to the group, one of them is government inaction and bureaucratic delays. They explain that successive governments may have been too slow to ratify the necessary uh, timber permits with only 11 out of 148 permits since 2014 being ratified. Also, institutional capacity issues. The Forestry Commission and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources may be lacking the resources or expertise to manage the backlog of uh, permits. This may be a reason. There's the mention of corruption and illegal logging. Uh, they say vested interest in illegal logging may resist the enforcement of the legal framework. Possible reason. Also, is the lack of political priority. And they explain that environmental sustainability has not been prioritized of other political and economic issues. Uh, also, complex legal procedures, uh, the complex processes of reviewing and ratifying permits as to the delays. Also, lack of stakeholder consultation or coordination. And they say that poor collaborating among stakeholders, including government agencies and parliament, slows the progress. They add that addressing these challenges requires stronger government commitment, improved institutional capacity, and streamlined legal processes. The, the need to ratify these stand leases, if we fail to ratify them, like um, my sister said, we, we, we risk, we risk um, being alienated on the international market. Um, we will not get our timber into the EU market. And, um, and there is also a big threat that is uh, coming up. There is a new EU regulation, the EU deforestation regulation, which, which also affects timber or wood products. If we are not careful, if we don't complete this process, that regulation, which comes into force at the end of the year, will also put a certain limit or some hindrance on our ability to assess the EU market. So the ratification is very, very important. So we are calling on the chair of the Parliamentary Select Committee, the minister, and then the Forestry Commission to, as a matter of urgency, work towards ratifying the remaining 137 um, stand leases. And again, the second ask that we are asking is that, yes, it's good 
that this process of ratic ratification happens, but again, to, um, um, some form of confidence to our partners, especially the EU and then some society, our communities, there is a need to have a clear roadmap on how we intend to go about in enforcing our sustainability and, and our sustainable forest management principles, which are embedded in our laws. So these are two asks that we are asking, the ratification and also coming up with a clear roadmap that will lead us to uh, our ability to issue mm. a flight license in the coming uh, months or weeks. I see. Crosby, I mean, beyond ratification, what else is the group recommending? Well, the Forest Watch Ghana group is making some key recommendations to address uh, the delays in implementing Ghana's legal framework for, for timber trade. They're saying that there's the need to expedite the ratification process, and the group is urging the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, the Forestry Commission, and uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee to finalize the ratification of all remaining timber permits and leases by the end of this year. And now they say that this is crucial for safeguarding Ghana's forest resources and ensuring the country complies uh, with the VPA and maintaining an access to the EU market. There's also this, publish a roadmap for implementation. The group is calling on the government to announce and publish a detailed roadmap developed in consultation with all relevant stakeholders, including the CSOs, to ensure the full implementation of laws on sustainable forest management and legal timber trade, as well as strengthening enforcement of existing laws and the emphasizing the need for the government to fully implement laws on sustainable forest management and logging. You know the conversation about illegal mining, also known as Galamse. Now they say that this would help eradicate illegal timber harvesting and ensure that only legally sourced timber is traded. Also, there's a collaboration with civil society organizations and Forest Watch Ghana is offering its support to the government stating that CSOs in the forestry sector, they are ready uh, to assist in protecting Ghana's timber resources and forest reserves from illegal mining uh, activities as well as illegal logging, ensuring compliance with the VPA. Now they add that these recommendations aim to address the delays uh, as well as ensure sustainable management of forest resources and most importantly protect Ghana's timber trade with the European Union. Very well Crosby uh, and then thank you so much for the reporting. You're live here on News Central right here on TV3. When we come back we'll bring you more stories. Don't go away. This is your election command center. We're on regional hub, but let's bring you politics. Well, the flag bearer of the NDC is taking his campaign to the home region of his main opponent and flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahamadou Bamiya. John Mahama will visit the palace of the late Gambaga chief, pay homage to the palace of the overlord of the Mampurugu traditional area, Nabuhagu Abdullah Sheraga. Uh, and then proceed to visit a number of communities. Kamala Kluche is covering that particular tour of the Northeast region for us. Uh, you've seen on your screens pictures of John Mahama touching down. Let's interact with Kamala Kluche right now. Kamala, we understand. First stop for Mr. Mahama is Gambaga. What really can you report? Has the campaign started this afternoon? Absolutely, he's just ended that tour uh, of the visit to the late chief of Gambaga, who was a friend to the family that's me, John Mahama, and the wife, Lodina, as well. You will recall that Lodina Mahama started a project to, uh, you know, weigh down the issue about the witch camp. You know, the Gambaga area has the witches' camp, where to a very large extent, the the NGO that Lodina Mahama funds, or uh, that name, the chair of, have taken into account 
was taken upon myself to be able to take care of the witches. And so I joined the death of the late chief. And what it was one that was paid to clean the family. So John Mama had to go there to pay homage to him. But after six weeks, just behind him, behind me is the palace of of the Nayiri uh, here in Naleribu. So John Mahama just entered into the palace where that campaign is starting. He first started off on the Gambagra area. But what has he been saying on the issue of Hajj? He's been making the point, you know, just like he said in the past, that the cost of Hajj uh, really has been very expensive. And he does not think that, you know, the next administration, hopefully that would be the president of, would entertain any higher force of this. We also talked about the new region, the six new regions that are going to have uh, uh, hospitals. The hospitals should be regional based and they will be fully equipped, in which he said that he will see to it that personally he would ensure that the hospitals will be made. But if you if you look at what he's been telling the people, not much different. The issue about the economic uh, conditions of the country, he believed that Dr. Baumia, whose home region he is now, should have done quite a lot more on this, given the resources they made available to him. But the performance of the Baumia administration, or the Kufaru Baumia administration, according to John Mahama, very abysmal. Uh, well, because this meeting just started uh, with the Nairi, he is not spoken yet. But later today, John Mahama intends to hold a mega rally in the Walewale. Uh, uh, the town where he Pacific. expected to make some uh, statement, and that you know that is the hometown of the flag bearer of the MPP. Right, uh, uh, Komla. Just finally, we see a lot of supporters gathering behind the Nairis Palace. What's been the reception like? Just briefly, to his arrival to to the home region of the of the vice president and the NPP's flag bearer. Does it look like he's commanding the support from that particular place because of uh, the region we're talking about? Stemming from that poll that came from Global Info Analytics yesterday. Some improvement in the support that has come for John Mahama. I was here with him when he came for the building Ghana Court. That draws reception from the people, uh, which presupposes that he, yes, of course, they believe in what John Mahama can do and they have confidence in him. Not to say that uh, they, 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 they are supporting him just because it's just ending to that group. To them, and a good number of them who are speaking to us, uh, the late on will be showing in the, in the 7 p.m. news, it appears that they have a lot more confidence in John Mahama as compared to their own son, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, to, to the thief, Dr. Baumia. Right then, Komla, thank you very much for those details. That's Komla Kuluche. He is uh, my colleague who's following the John Mahama campaign team this afternoon in the home region of the vice president, which is the northeast region. We can't touch base with the vice president this afternoon because uh, he, as you know, is a flag bearer of the NPP, has a shared constituent in the western north uh, region of his commitment to development and social interventions. So Airbus with the driver's license and then Ghana driver's license is valid for six years but every two years we are just so go renewing and yes sir every two years just so go renewing maybe I know the license will be valid for 10 years and you renew every five years every five years you renew say so MPP bar Western North, Enyam Buntu, Enyaza, Ghana, Enyam Buntu, Matisse, Sa area, Yepe New District, Yepe Buaku as uh, Asafu, Asuensu District, Enyaza, Yamiadu, Yaba, Yepe Mamo District, no, Yepe Mamo District, no district, no. Chabai, Chabai. Him, 
we'll say in the Western North region, where uh, the running mate of the NDC, Professor Jane Nano Pukwajimang, has appealed to chiefs to add their voices to ensure a violence-free elections in the December polls. She made the appeal when she paid a Ketsi call on the chief of Achimfo in the Aowin constituency of the Western North region. The NDC vice presidential candidate is in the Western North region to canvass votes for the party. Her first port of call was in the Awin constituency at the chief's palace in Achenfo. Professor Jinana said electoral violence should not be tolerated in the upcoming elections. <laughs> That recorded in the past election was unfortunate, and we do not want the same repeated in this year's election. The same also said the equity register, no, and send me more and fatter. Money in the perfect no beer, now soon yaba. Things that can cause chaos, for example, is his refusal for a forensic audit. Addressing a crowd of supporters later at a park, Professor Jane Nana asked the people to choose and vote massively for the NDC as the party has better policies that would help propel developments to improve the economy and the lives of Ghanaians. At communities in Suamai and Bodhi, the vice presidential candidate said the education sector has been mismanaged and charged the people to vote for the NDC. We are going to abolish the double track system. The NDC also has a record in the building of educational infrastructure. Professor Jinana continued to explain to the people the benefits that the Women's Development Bank would have on women, their families and society. NDC members in the Ifijakwaibre South constituency of the Ashanti region have expressed dissatisfaction over claims of disunity among party members at the constituency level. The concerned party faithful accused the constituency executives for not supporting the campaign activities of the parliamentary candidate Vivian Nuzagla. Uh, the group stressed that winning the seat will not be possible without a collective effort. As a result, the need to offer maximum support to the parliamentary candidate to strengthen the party's door-to-door -door campaign. Ayuba Osman is the convener of the concerned party members. NDC parliamentary candidate in the person of Madame Vivian Nozar has been neglected and left to face the downtown tax to look for resources to fund her campaign in such a big constituency all by herself. Such development is viewed against a recent statement made by the constituency communication officer during the party's campaign launch at Tamale to the effect that he does not work for the cause of the parliamentary candidate other than our presidential candidate JDM, John Dramani Mahama. So our uh, executives have neglected or has left our parliamentary candidate to her own fate, to campaign on her own without any needed support. If you look at a constituency with a population of 120,000 voters, and if we are even lacking T-shirts, we are not even having proper van to communicate to this particular, or to communicate... Concerned party members of the NDC in the Efija Kwabre South constituency. We can now speak to Ibrahim Abubakar, who's our correspondent following the story. He's joining us via Zoom. Ibrahim, good afternoon to you. The, you know, the concerned party members say that the constituency executives are not supporting the parliamentary candidate in that constituency enough. Uh, what have the executives been saying in response to this? Well, Kemeni, they have denied that lightly. In fact, they have admitted that a vehicle that's a pickup vehicle has been presented to the constituency for campaign activities. But then the fact that they are not following the parliamentary candidates 
to campaign doesn't mean they are also not, not moving to other places and campaign. Because this is a huge constituency that has over 100,000 um, voters. So they have divided themselves and are also going to other hard to reach um, communities so that they will be able to canvass for votes for her. But even with that, um, Kemini, you can sense that uh, that unity is not there because. And um, prior to the primaries, they had their preferred choice of um, parliamentary candidate, and that person lost. So that division has been there. But like I said, they said uh, there is nothing like that. They are doing everything they can within their reach to support the parliamentary candidate and also ensure that uh, John Dramani Mahama Amas is both there. In fact, this is a constituency that, like, um, that the NDC um, has even found it difficult to get even 20%. But this time around, they are saying they are targeting 50% plus one so that they will be able to get the majority of the vote and eventually win the seat. But with all this division, um, the concerned party um, supporters, like you rightly said, they mentioned that if they do not unite and canvas for votes, then it will be difficult for them to even get the 18% vote they, they got in the 2020 elections. What are the executives saying about how to bring back into the fold uh, these concerned members? Well, they said that um, they are also doing their part and they will make sure that they engage these supporters so that um, that division wouldn't um, go on. In fact, the regional executives have also been appealed to, so, and the information I'm getting is that the regional executives are also intervening so that all of them will um, join hands together and continue with their campaign activities. Idi Ibrahim, thank you so much for the reporting. Ibrahim Abubakar joined us from the Fijia Kwabre South constituency uh, on that story. Now, we'll stay in the Ashanti region because a growing number of children have been diagnosed with measles rubella in that region and it's become a major concern for the Ghana Health Service. The region's case is said to have moved from 9 in 2018 to 114 in middle of 2024. Alarmed with the worrying trend, the regional health directory is targeting vaccination of 1 million children between the ages of 9 and 59 months in the region as part of the national vaccination exercise to prevent a surge in cases and associated mortality. Dogana has made significant gains in controlling measles, as record shows that no child has died from measles in the country for the past 15 years. The disease is endemic. Health officials in the Ashanti region, however, fear the surge in cases may not only maim children, but also cause their death if not tackled. Addressing the media in Kumasi, Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Fred Adumaku Boatin, expects parents to ensure that their children between 9 to 59 months are not left out of the nationwide immunization exercise scheduled to begin on October 2 to October 6. Measles, rubella, kills. The complications are something that you cannot really pay for. And you never know who is going to be at risk. I believe that you don't want your child to have to be blind or to be deaf. And this is the opportunity that you have that you can vaccinate your child against measles and rubella. And we said that vitamin A is also a challenge. Therefore, we are taking opportunity to give every susceptible child vitamin A during this campaign. So when you see our health workers coming, the idea is to protect your children against these preventable diseases. The increasing cases of hypertension in the region is also a cause for concern to health officials. The health directorate is taking steps to control the mortality rates linked to hypertension. A lot of people are having hypertension, but they don't know. That is the problem. And so our campaign is to make sure that a lot of people with this disease, but unknown to them, should be picked up. So for us, our intention is to screen as much as possible to pick these people. Because if you even look at the heart failure, 75% of heart failure is caused by hypertension. 
hypertension that we can do a lot. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 News, Kumasi. And in the studio, Kemeni Amano, you're still live here on New Central. When we take this, we're on a quick break. When we we'll go on a quick break, when we come back, we'll take some more stories. Don't go away. We'll stay on a bit more politics for you, where the opposition NDC is warning of a potential challenge on election day. Should the EC fail to allow for an audit of its IT system ahead of the polls, the Electoral Commission has again warded off demands for an audit of the voters' register following a marathon IPAC meeting yesterday. The Commission has, however, acceded to re exhibiting the voters' register to allow for transparency. The NDC, despite agreeing to this, wants an audit of the EC's IT system. Here's what they've been demanding in a statement by their General Secretary, Fifi Fiavi Quete. And amongst many other things, uh, the party has accepted the EC's uh, promise to release to political parties the uh, corrected or updated version of the 2024 Provisional uh, Voters Register for scrutiny. Within one week, uh, they welcomed the decision by the EC to re-exhibit the updated provisional register. Uh, a bit more from them. The party, however, recommends that the re-exhibition exercise should be conducted online and offline at the exhibition centers. Now, here's the key demand. The NDC demands a multi-stakeholder and inter-party examination of the IT system of the Electoral Commission with the aim of addressing uh, the vulnerabilities that the EC itself has admitted to, which vulnerabilities led to the several anomalies they have raised. And so that's the NDC's uh, concerns, bringing us to uh, the end of this afternoon's bulletin, uh, where we can scan uh, and be a part of the 3 News WhatsApp channel quickly. Pick up your smartphones and scan that QR code for us and join the 3 News WhatsApp channel that's where you find all the news cards uh, links to 3news.com and everything news related from us here at media general uh like i said our bulletin the very first this week quite interesting yes right? <laughs> uh, well never have brought yeah never has it been two continuous days <laughs> that we've been here in a week but we're, we're back here now. today and so <laughs> We'll be back tomorrow as well. I am Maureen Aigbeta. And I am Kevin Yaman on the afternoon show returns as well yeah, with, think, An yeah. with Anita. And then Godwin. <laughs> and as well. Godwin. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Bye bye.